But the timing of these Chinese advertisements telling their citizens to, to accumulate gold was basically um, around about the time when uh, we had um, the great financial crisis developing, which ended up with Lehman you know, going bust and all the rest of it. So obviously, the, you, you could see that the psychology, if you like, of the Chinese leadership, you know, looking at what was going on in the dollar and thinking, hold on a minute, this is not good for our citizens. They were encouraging Chinese citizens to go out and buy gold. So interesting point about the timing of that. Now, I think that that by that 2002 date, just looking at those flows, I reck that at contemporary prices, the People's Bank could easily have accumulated up to 20,000 tons of gold. Amidst the global tumult sparked by the freezing of Russian currency reserves and the subsequent surge in gold purchases by China's central bank, the true extent of China's gold reserves is shrouded in speculation. Alistair MacLeod, head of research at goldmoney.com, comma, suggests China may have accumulated 20,000 tons of gold by 2002 far more than officially reported. This highlights the secrecy surrounding China's gold reserves, with only a fraction disclosed by the People's Bank of China. Such conjecture gains conviction from a recent survey conducted by the World Gold Council, revealing a shift in central bank sentiments towards gold. While optimism wanes regarding the future role of the U.S. dollar, confidence in gold as a reserve asset is on the rise. Six out of every ten central banks surveyed anticipate a more significant allocation to gold in their reserves going forward. China's proactive approach to bolstering its gold reserves is evident. According to the World Gold Council, since October 2022, it has increased the proportion of gold in its total financial reserves from 3.2% to 4.6%. Presently, China boasts the sixth largest gold stockpile globally, trailing closely behind Russia. Alistair suggests China's strategy reaches beyond central bank acquisitions. The nation is opening gold and silver markets to the public encouraging gold as a wealth-preserving asset amidst economic uncertainty spurred by the global financial crisis. Such encouragement has yielded tangible results, and the first quarter of this year witnessed a 5.94% increase in gold consumption in China, reaching 308.91 tons, as the state-backed China Gold Association reported. Simultaneously, Imports of gold raw materials surged by a remarkable 78%, contributing to a 21.16% jump in the country's total gold output during the same period. Come along as we explore Alistair McLeod's valuable insights. Don't miss out on our latest updates. Subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you for tuning in. Now, basically, the other thing that the People's Bank was doing, um, and you've got to remember that um, there were huge restrictions on what individuals could do. There were very strict exchange controls, for example, and uh, the public were not permitted to acquire gold and silver themselves. Um, holding gold was illegal until 2002. Uh, so all the foreign exchange dealings, when you had inward investment as China opened up its economy to manufacturing, and then subsequently, um, the continuation of those flows and at the same time, uh, the um, export trade was beginning to boom in, you know, really from the early 1990s, right, or 93, 94, it really began to boom from then. Um, if you looked at those flows and calculated um, the reinvestment of those flows into contemporary gold prices, which you may recall fell to as low as 250 dollars an ounce in 1999 and I think 2002, um, it was easy for China to accumulate substantial quantities of gold without really the rest of the world noticing, particularly with the uh, world's attention taken away from gold, because it was, as far as the Americans were concerned, relegated to the status of a pet rock. Um, so you could see that this was a very good opportunity for the Chinese who never bought into this sort of um, fiat Keynesian paradigm, as it were, concept uh, of a fiat currency. Um, they never bought into that at all. But they did understand, they still understand that gold is money and the rest is credit. I calculated that by 2002, when quite Clearly, the People's Bank took the view that the state had acquired enough gold. By then, incidentally, I think the official holdings were in the order of 600 tons. I mean, peanuts, really. 
Um, but clearly, uh, the Chinese um, government authorities and the People's Bank decided that they had accumulated enough of a gold reserve, which was sort of distributed around various accounts, like uh, the People's Liberation Army, the youth wing of the Communist Party, and so on and so forth not reflected in the People's Bank's reser reserves. This is the important case, the, the important point. Um, uh, so by 2002, um, clearly having the state got its position um, to its satisfaction, it then opened up the market, the gold and silver market, to uh, the Chinese public. The Chinese public were actually encouraged uh, by um, the Chinese authorities to use the, sh the newly set up Shanghai Gold Exchange to acquire gold as part of their own um, wealth. Um, they have television adverts and all the rest of it were, were you know, this was... But the thing, thing that's interesting about the timing of that was that the timing of these Chinese advertisements telling their citizens to, to accumulate gold was basically um, around about the time when uh, we had um, the great financial crisis developing, which, which ended up with Lehman, um, you know, going bust and all the rest of it. Uh, so obviously, the, you, you could see that the psychology, if you like, of the Chinese leadership, you know, looking at what was going on in the dollar and thinking, hold on a minute, this is not good for our citizens. They were encouraging Chinese citizens to go out and buy gold. So interesting point about the timing of that. Alistair delves into the current economic landscape, shedding light on the looming specter of a debt trap gripping the U.S. government. Amidst escalating inflation, the crux of the issue lies in the government's challenge to finance its debt amidst rising bond yields. According to the Treasury Department, the national debt has surged to unprecedented levels, surpassing $30 trillion in 2022, a sharp escalation from $22.7 trillion in 2019, largely fueled by the government's response to the pandemic. Alarmingly, there's a conspicuous absence of a concrete plan to address this burgeoning debt. In this scenario, Alice Dare underscores a flight from credit to gold, as gold emerges as a beacon of stability, devoid of counterparty risk, and recognized as a legitimate form of money. He accentuates gold's allure as an investment haven underpinned by its intrinsic properties during economic turbulence. This year's surge in bullion prices is remarkable, mainly as certain central banks display unusually aggressive tendencies in gold acquisition. Despite minor setbacks, gold prices have ascended by 40% from the trough witnessed in October 2022. Let's get back to the interview. Inflation is going up, but the real crisis isn't so much inflation. It is the debt trap that the U.S. government has got it itself in. It is then the question as to how high, how high bond yields have got to go for the US government to fund its debt. And there is a further question on that, and that is the higher these rates go, does it make that debt more attractive to fund, rather like the situation that Volcker sorted out when debt to GDP, incidentally, was something in the order of about 30%? Or is this a situation where higher rates actually make the debt even less attractive? It's beginning to look like the latter. And the more people begin to understand this, the more the flight out of credit will gather. And that flight will go into gold because gold is the legal form of money. Not only is it the legal form of money, but it has no counterparty risk. You don't want to be in anything where there is counterparty risk. And unfortunately, the consequences for the private sector economy are equally appalling. There has been so much malinvestment. It is the result of uh, suppressed interest rates, suppressed down to the zero bound for a prolonged period of time. And, uh, you know, businesses have been borrowing credit off the banks, off, um, you know, funding it, you know, sort of short term. By short term, I mean up to two years sort of thing. Um uh, not because they were deploying it productively, but because the opportunity to get this, you know, to get credit in order to speculate in something is just too attractive to miss. Now that we've gone from zero to five, and it looks like the yield curve will actually go positive, 
This is a real crisis. I mean, we've seen we've seen regional bank failures. That's just the start of it. The real the real trouble is yet ahead of us. Coming back to the relationship between gold and debt, it is extraordinary. And we have not seen this since the 1970s. It is extraordinary to this generation, if you like, of uh, investors to see bond yields rising, the dollar rising, and gold rising all at the same time. And I think I have just told you the message as to why that relationship is, is back in place, having last been seen in the 1970s. As more and more central banks and investors turn to gold to protect their money when the economy is uncertain, gold becomes even more critical for keeping wealth safe and holding on to its value. Considering the current trends in gold acquisition by central banks, what implications do you foresee for the future of gold as a reserve asset? Share your perspective in the comments below. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.